Them talk. I'm Paul Durienzo, your host, and we have another great show in store for you. Our guest, Sandy Hanna, the author of the book that we're going to be talking about. It's called The Ignorance of Bliss, An American Kid in Saigon. And the subtitle here is I Am a Spy, a Brat, a Child Growing Up in Vietnam in 1960. Welcome to the show, Sandy. Thank you, Hanna. Paul. And what a great book. I haven't had a chance to read it, but I can't wait. I hope I can keep this copy you and read get, it. You Thank get you. To keep you can the copy. sign it and everything for me. Because mm -hmm. I am very fascinated with the Vietnam War, especially a book that is about those early days. So what's it like? What is an army brat? I think people think when they hear the word brat that it's a brat, like mm -hmm. lowercase letters, B R A T, right. but it really stands for British Regiment Attached Transfer. And that happened long ago when dependents of military families were, you know, following their, the officer to wherever they went. There are probably 15 million adult brats in this country. We're not mm -hmm. counting the kids that are overseas or here. Right. And we're a subculture that most people don't even know about. Right. What's it like to be a kid and grow up on a military base? Actually, it's great because mm -hmm. we're... With brats, we're all alike. Mm -hmm. we, we meet, we immediately make friends with each other. We don't know if you're leaving tomorrow or I'm leaving tomorrow because mm -hmm. generally we're, we're a transient gypsy group. So we just find out what we like about a person, make friends, and that's it. And then we are just as easily, we walk away from our friends, our pets, our homes, our teachers, and we start again. Mm -hmm. So we're very, we're just a very restless group. What was it like? Do you remember what it was like when your dad got orders to go to Vietnam? Yes, we came home from school that day, my sister and I. Where and was that? In, you were this was in. actually in Hinsdale, Illinois, because uh, they sent him for a master's at the University of Chicago to get him ready for something. He was going to be chief of ordnance for MAG, Military uh, Advisory a Group. And so I think they gave him some kind of management work at that time. So we're in Hinsdale, Illinois. We're actually being civilians, which mm -hmm. was really hard. We don't do well with civilians, especially as kids, because we don't understand them. They've been there forever. We come and we go. So we came home from school that day, and I could tell something was up because my father and mother were smiling. My younger brother and my older brother were sitting there. And one of the things that we always did was we took a globe and would put it on the table, and my dad would spin it. And that's how we found out where we were going. So as it slowed down, he put his finger on and said, okay. And at that time, it was his old globe from Texas A&M. So it said Indochina, all right? <laughs> so he says, well, it's Vietnam now, but it was called Indochina. And then he backtracked to tell us how and when we were going. And they never gave us much time. They always gave us notice about a week ahead. And they'd say, "Find, pick one thing that you want to take with you." Really? And that's what you're going to pick one thing. Pick one thing. Wow. And he left everything else. Wow. And then off you were. Off we went, and we took how that old trip. Were, how old were you at that time? Ten. Ten. And what year was that? Uh, it was 1960. So that was before the Vietnam War that we know and I grew up in existed. It was pre pre war. It was. At the time, what had happened was they had divided the country from north and south. That was, uh, the, the Gene Geneva Accord got written mm -hmm. in order to try to get peace because the Allies had given the French back mm -hmm. Vietnam and Algeria. But Vietnam had been fighting for a nationalistic stance. They wanted a unified country. They didn't want to be a colonial power anymore. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be dependent. And the war started again with them, French and, and Indochina War. So the Geneva Accord divided and said, okay, peace, you guys, for two years. We're going to have peace between 54 and 56. And during that time, you know, Ho Chi Minh, you manage the North, and uh, we'll bring in, they were going to put Emperor Bo Dai, but he wanted to be a playboy in France, so he didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So he had Diem come from France, and Jim had no support at all, but he came and took over the South, but his brother did, knew, 
and new orchestrated everything. Right. The so, Young Brothers, they were, they're infamous. They're infamous. If you know anything about, about Vietnamese history, which hopefully it's some Americans must know about a Vietnamese history, who are the Diem Brothers? The Diem Brothers were an interesting group. They were, they were poor. Um, one of the brothers was the Catholic bishop, so he had some power. Another uh, brother, Can, was also quite poor, but Nu was the one who really convinced everybody to support Diem when he came. In fact, um, I, and I refer to that in the book, the, the uh, officer that was my father's counterpart, when he told his story, he said, I had to go meet the plane, I had to go meet him, and they were still arguing about whether uh, they, these different groups, these different religious uh, mm -hmm. groups, the Hoi Hoi and all of them, were going to support Jim. And they agreed because he said, New said, he'll go back and he won't come. So they agreed. So what happened was there was really no, nothing in the South that would support this guy. But we chose, we violated the accord. We being the United States. The United States. There was supposed Not to be peace. Not you personally and no. your dad personally. No, no, no. <laughs> what happened was there was supposed to be an election mm -hmm. in 56, two years of peace. Yeah. But Jim held an election for himself and counted more people than in the country, proclaimed himself president, and then created the Republic of South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the United States violated their own accord and supported this regime thinking they'd have control. But the Jim regime didn't really, they weren't pro-American. They really weren't supportive of the American. Sounds like a guy named Juan Guaido, if you've been in Venezuela. Oh. <laughs> it's like, to, you were saying we're repeating the oh, same problem. Oh, history repeats itself. Another nobody, they picked out of nothing and decided to make the president of the country and put everything behind him. But what is the, now as a kid, you're, you're 10 years old, mm -hmm. so I mean, I, I was fairly aware when I was 10 years old. Were you politically aware? Were you astute to any of this stuff? I think I was a kid and it was such an extraordinary place. You landed and it was exotic and mm. you were in a, we were put up in a French villa and we had servants and a chauffeur and we were just down the street on Don Tidiem from the ambassador and we were part of the French swim club, the Cirque Sportif. Mm -hmm. And so our life was really- Did you pick up some French? Yes, because my Vietnamese was horrible. I, Vietnamese is tonal, so it's like our word oh, 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 oh. It means different things. So I insulted so many people that I just learned French. It was easier. Just speak and, French. And, and, and they spoke French. Everybody spoke French. Right. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was definitely an incredible time. But what changed me from just being this you know, out of touch, having a great time mm -hmm. little kid was um, Is this you then? That's me. That's my Circle Sportive photo. Right. <laughs> for so the there circle. you are in the book. <laughs> and just a, a kid playing around in Saigon in 1960. And it was great. But then one day, uh, our parents were going somewhere, and we I heard something that sounded like a parade. Mm -hmm. Now, on a military base, the parade is tanks and guns and soldiers and and usually a band. Mm -hmm. So my brother said, no, you're not gonna go. You have to stay here, I'll check it out. But we snuck, there were four of us. Mm -hmm. my, my brother was 13, I was 10, my sister was eight, and my little brother was five. Oh no, the whole gang there. And so we kind Trouble. of, we were doing like duck and dive behind the eucalyptus trees and walking up Don't mm -hmm. trying to get yeah. to where this was. Well, it turned out it was, it was on the, the road going to the palace, mm -hmm. Diem's palace. And we got in front of the crowd and we're right in front. My brother had brought his basketball. He had it under his arm and somebody hit it and it started rolling under the tank and you saw the word spalding as it went underneath, you know. Mm -hmm. And about that time there was something that sounded like a firecracker behind us. But this truck with very young looking Vietnamese men with M1s started shooting. Right. And everyone... In your direction? Um, yeah, about three people away from us started falling. So we pulled back in, we ran home. We were holding on to each other with like death-like grips. We got to the house, slammed the door open, ran up the stairs, slid across the marble floor under the bed, and that's where we stayed. Now we had an unwritten agreement among us kids, which was if the parents didn't ask you, you didn't tell. Mm -hmm. And even though they found us under the bed, they didn't ask us why we were under the bed. You were in a coup. 
but and so almost came three people away from, <laughs> yeah. from like people being shot. And I was pretty sure. I kept saying to my brother, "Did you see all those bodies?" And he goes, "I didn't see anything because he didn't want me to actually go there, mm -hmm. or my brother and my sister." You saw them though. I saw them. And so what happened was about a day or two later, my dad was reading a document, which I also include in the book, from uh, the, the general saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, no, it was actually from Jim, and it said, all of you who uh, have lost your way, come home, you're welcome to come home and mm -hmm. be part of, you know, so he forgave them. Okay. And so my dad is reading this to us, and I'm looking at my brother, and you know, because I yes. know yes. there are bodies. And okay. and at some point, my dad said, "Yeah, there was a coup, and 400 people got shot." And that was, th and that that's was the beginning of my and awareness. And that's when DM, the DM brothers were killed. No, oh, this, this is was 1960. This is when they came into power. Yes, they, and it was a coup, and it was it was an army coup. Mm -hmm. Now later, over in who is in power at that Jim. time? Jim. The oh. army did not like him, nor oh, did they right, support. Right. Now I remember and it was yes, so yes. corrupt because it was only about, you know, they only promoted people who were family members or people oh. who were loyal. Mm. And it was such a corrupt regime. They were putting everybody in prison, but they were telling the Americans they were Viet Cong. They mm. weren't. They were, right. they were professors and people who were against the government. But the coup didn't work. It didn't go through. It didn't go through uh, because there was one uh, one division uh, that had not been cut off. They cut off all the roads except that one, and it came in, and, and Dim stalled the negotiations, because what they were trying to do was get something good for the people. And then there was another coup, and that was, uh, that was I think, in 62, in which we were at school, and we were going on our bus, and all of a sudden it turns around and drops it at home, and we're watching the bombing of the palace. That was when the Air Force decided that they were going to try to kill Tim. And was that another failed coup? And that was another failed coup. So <laughs> this guy, had, <laughs> he was going around with like, and he wasn't like, one brother was really a smart one and the other one was really just went along with it. Well, I think Jim wanted to be the emperor and he was, he was, he felt he, there's a belief in what they call the mandate of heaven. He felt that he was the chosen one of heaven. Uh -huh. But Ho Chi Minh also felt that too. Right. And the people were much more in tune with Ho Chi Minh because he was about the people. And at that time, you know, it, they have fought the Chinese for 2,000 years. So this wasn't a country that was going to go to communism. Mm -hmm. This was a country that did not want to be a colonial, right. you know, yeah. par uh, within their power. And so the yeah. unfortunate part Third is... Third world communism is a bit like more of a military organization almost philosophy yeah. than, uh, than the political theory that Marx, Karl Marx was talking about. Right. Yeah. And, and also Ho Chi Minh had gone around. He'd lived in the United States. He'd lived in France. He was picking and choosing ideas to bring yeah. back to his country. So when he, and he even wrote letters to Truman mm -hmm. about how this was like sure. our civil, our war. Right. But and he Truman, was in New York. And he was, Truman he never. He in New York yeah. briefly. Didn't he? Right. he was like waited tables or something. Yeah, and Truman York. never read yeah. it. And so when this all happened, he couldn't believe it, you know, and he had fought, his Viet uh, Minh mm -hmm. had fought with the Americans against the Japanese during World mm -hmm. War II to help get the Japanese out of, into mm -hmm. China, Vietnam. Right. So tell us more about your experiences now. In, so what was it like, um, uh, what was Saigon like? What did you see? What was, what was the Saigon of the early, you know, we've all seen Miss Saigon or heard the story. I mean, well, was it sort of this romantic place of it was uh, intrigue and yes, it poverty was, uh, crossing? You know, I, th I said it was like plot and counterplot along with this exotic uh, place because it was French architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was just incredible. And there were so many smells and sounds and just a density of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were streets, that whole streets of flowers, whole streets of animals, mm -hmm. uh, these beautiful, beautiful cafes. And also there were the cafes with the, uh, the ladies, I call them the, the pearls of the Orient. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the older kids that were there had the best life ever. Uh -huh. I mean, they were, we were unsupervised. Let's just say that as kids. Mm -hmm. We were not we could go and do anything like typical American kids of that generation, and they not were like today. Not, no, not no, the helicopter moms or the no. Uh, you were none you of that. you just kind of went out, and yeah. 
you know, we would get sent a lot. It was like that for me, too. I mean, just <laughs> a generation. Like, we're almost the same age. We would get sent a lot. My mother would was sure she knew where we were, yeah. which, of course, she didn't. But she would send us to the swim club, or she'd mm -hmm. send us to what was an underground theater. Now, the underground theater was actually in a storefront with a grill on it that yeah. we would get dropped off out of a military transport that we would catch in front of the postal exchange. Mm -hmm. So we would, you know, buy candy and things, and then we'd go in, and it would go down, and there was always a USO show with a yeah. blonde bimbette dropping a baton. So it was like a bunker. It was a bunker with these shows, but the shows wouldn't change if the general was on reconnaissance. So I had watched The World of Susie Wong 21 times. That movie. That movie. I can right. do it. You can play Was it two the notes. only movie they had? No, they were waiting for the general to come back. They wouldn't change the movie until he had seen it. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So on that particular day, I noticed that my brother was not in the room with me. He was not up in the, in the balcony where we were forbidden to go. Mm -hmm. And I saw him running across the square. Now, there was an, there's an interesting thing that we children learned. The, the, the circles and the traffic was amazing. So if you wanted to get across, you had to zen which meant that you just calmly stepped out, you didn't look right, you didn't look left, you didn't stop, and you went across. If you stopped, you'd die. If you look right or left, you'd die. <laughs> so, you so have to leave of, it to them to go around you as so you So all of us kids it. would zen. So he was running, he zenned, he got on the bus, and oh I said, gosh. I'll tell if you don't take me with you. Okay. And he said, what do we do about the younger kids? I said, I'll, I'll tell them I'm mm -hmm. going to sell them. It's like Huck Finn. Yeah. It's like a Huck Finn story in <laughs> Vietnam in 1960 to 62. And we're speaking with the author of the book, Sandy Hanna, who wrote The Ignorance of Bliss, An American Kid in Saigon, in which it says, I am a spy, a brat, a child growing up in Vietnam in 1960. Her dad, your dad is an interesting guy. You were telling me he had a military career spanning to World War II in Europe, right? Yes, he was Patton's ordnance officer, and he worked on the design of the Sherman tank. So he was, and then in World War II, when he went over, because he was sent along with a lot of tanks, because mm -hmm. Patton wanted somebody he could, like, punish if they didn't work. Okay. But instead, he kept my dad, because he liked him and made him procurement officer. And so his whole job was wheeling and dealing and, you know, filling up water tanks with French cognac and wine and getting treads and writing false requisition orders. He found a BMW convertible under a haystack. Mm -hmm. He silk screened a Red Cross emblem, put false orders in it, and drove it through the war. Oh, really? That oh, was yeah. The that was that was the colonel. <laughs> he had a BMW <laughs> during World War II in Europe. Very interesting. Uh, so, and the, you, you refer to your dad as the colonel. I refer to him. I call him the colonel. Oh. And the colonel, um, when he was 86, how this book came to be written was. I would always go home to visit. At that point in time, they had retired. We all went. One went to Alaska, one went to Jersey, one went down to Texas. We just spread out. But my parents picked Kentucky near Fort Knox mm -hmm. uh, to retire. And I would go there and I would get things. He would give me things that he hid somewhere in the basement. Mm -hmm. We could never find his stash. Right. But one day he came up with this uh, weathered folder, like a military folder that had beautiful onion skin paper on it that with this beautiful handwriting, and he put it there, and there were also some letters in it, and he shoved it over to me, and he said, okay, it's time. He said, do you remember Vietnam? And I said, yeah, I, I do. Because he didn't realize that that whole time I had been spying on him. Oh, boy. You know, whenever anything would happen at night, I'd be in the st on the staircase listening. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, sure. so I had actually pretty much seen everything that was going on in reference to this. And he had a counterpart, Colonel Lee Van Sam, whose wife was the, um, the wife was the cousin of Madame New. So, uh, New. She was, a, how was she known? She was known in the, in the Dragon Woman. She in was the popular culture, Life Magazine, and places yeah, like that. She, she was, was the Dragon Woman. Yeah. And she happened to be up in Dalat vacationing, and as well as Mrs. Sam. And she was seen by Mrs. Sam going, uh, General Dawn, Vietnamese General Dawn, going into her boudoir. Now, Mrs. Sam, was seen by Madame New and panicked, packed up her kids, drove, got back to Saigon, told her husband, uh, who was my father's counterpart, and he sat down for two days and wrote an expose on every single member of the regime, how they were not pro-American, and everything that was going on in terms of graft and who was paid off, 
and the spying, the spying on anyone, anyone associated with Americans were put in his black book. And there was an unbelievable thing going on. And the Jim, the- Why did he write all this stuff? Uh, he wrote it because he thought he was gonna get killed. Because he knew something, something embarrassing. Something was gonna happen because Madame knew had seen it. Right, he knew well, about the affair, right? But she didn't want anybody to know her business. Yeah. So about a few weeks later, he was in prison. And so my father, and he, they said he had stolen or he'd done something with the depots. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad was in charge of all the depots, so he had them all inventoried. He proved mm -hmm. that he wasn't. But Colonel Sam never got his position back as chief of ordnance for the South Vietnamese Army. But he, he wasn't taken out of the military. And then about a year later, they, they basically kicked him out of the military. Right. Oh so, well, so that might have been for the best. Well, I, you know, my dad asked him when we, when we left, you know, let me get you out. And that would have been 1962. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam said he had five ways out, but we never found him. And mm -hmm. so with this expose, it pretty much gives you a, a look at the history of what was mm -hmm. really going on. You actually saw, uh, there's a picture of Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, He's been vice president at that he point. He was vice president. Vice president, right, visiting Saigon, and what was that? Well, he had basically come to meet with Jim, and he was saying that, you know, this is the fellow who's going to stop the, the sea of the red tide. Now, this country was so inundated with, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and, and domino theories and everything else, mm -hmm. and had no understanding that this country wasn't exactly in that mode. but. He was saying that, and that's what the press was saying. So he was going to, after he had the meeting with uh, Jim, mm -hmm. he was going to meet with all of us who were there, children and dependents and military that officers. And so there was to be a platform that was built for him to give his speech. Only the Vietnamese built it over the manure pile in back of the, the stable. Now, we kids knew that it was over the manure pile, <laughs> the adults didn't. <laughs> And you would and that think, though, that uh, somebody like Lyndon Johnson from Texas, who lived on a ranch, you know, would have known. He might have thought because it was near the stables. <laughs> he might have just thought Did there was a it? wind. Could you smell it? Was I could it? smell it. Right. I'm sure he could smell it too. <laughs> he was Lyndon Johnson. But it was it was a clear, you know, statement of mm -hmm. here's the reality. Sure. So the reality was so. Do you, were, I don't know if you were old enough to, rec when, when the DM brothers were finally assassinated in 1963, were you out already out of the We country? had already left in 62. Was your dad just ro rotated to a new place? Or? We were sent to Fort Monroe, Virginia, and of course immediately it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So my dad got shipped down to Homestead because of his experience with ordnance. And I must say that Where's I- Where's Homestead? down to Florida. Right. In fact, there's still missile uh, missiles down there that are in mm -hmm. uh, bunkers. If you go yeah. down there, you sure. can see them. Sure. Um, and so for me, I, I was extremely angry, you know, because all of a sudden we were back in the States where I thought, oh good, because we'd already mm -hmm. gone through coups, two coups, bombings, some kidnappings, all these other things the that were going on. the bombing happened? The bombing happened in 62, and actually, we got we could watch the bombing and we knew that I knew my and mother was dropping bombs from planes type of and bombing. our building was shaking mm -hmm. and the three kids were we were all up watching it so it didn't seem very stable it no it wasn't but we were you know we were kids but they were sending the information we were getting back home I was a bit young but was that oh this is a solid stable government with support but what you're telling me is total chaos is going on no it was there they were the the regime that was being supported was not one that was on the same page and what jim was was able to do was anytime there was a, a meeting where these officials came from the united states he would have new talk to them and he would just pontificate on his idea. He had a, a philosophy called personalism, and he could go on for hours until they fell asleep. Uh -huh. You know, they never understood what he was talking about. Right, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 I heard about that. So, uh, uh, looking back on this experience, tell us, so uh, wh how can folks find your book, uh, The Ignorance of Bliss, An American Kid in Saigon, published by Post Hill, which is a new, pr relatively new press, right? And uh, yes. how can people find this? Well, Postal Press is a spinoff of Simon & Schuster. 
And so Simon & Schuster has done all the distribution. So you'll find it in bookstores. You'll find it at Barnes & Noble. Uh, but you can also find it online. Uh, you can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go to Simon & Schuster. You can go to Postal Press. You can go to Amazon and, and order it. Right. And so there's, also, there's also a Kindle. There's an e-book. Oh, and uh, we're in the process of doing a, an audio book. Oh, really? Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, anybody who's interested, and I know a lot of my uh, viewers are the type of folks who would be really interested in the history of Vietnam and the Vietnam War, and this is it from a different perspective of a 10-year-old American girl running wild with no supervision <laughs> in the middle of an unstable government situation mm -hmm. on the eve of the of Vietnam becoming, War. Yes. Did your dad, uh, what does your dad think? Like, go, looking back on that experience, you know, I know soldiers just follow orders. They just do what they're told mostly, but what does your dad think about it? Uh, when we came back, because he had two, mo two years in, in uh, Fort Monroe, and they were going to send him back, mm -hmm. and he retired. My brother was the fifth person to be, that was going to be recruited uh, in Chicago for the draft, and then the draft um, was ending. Yeah. And my father helped, tried to help him get him off. And he said, and if I don't get you off, you will be handing ping pong balls out in, in Hawaii. He went to, he took the expose and he, yeah. went to the, he went to the Pentagon. He tried to build an awareness of what was really going on. And, and, and also in terms of trying to help Colonel Sam. And they basically said, nothing will be done about Sam and nothing mm -hmm. will be done. How about Colonel Lansdale? Did you ever visit him? We don't have a lot of time, but did you ever meet uh, Colonel Lansdale, I have Edward a, Lansdale? I might have met him as a kid, but I wouldn't. Re I don't did remember. Did you see these CIA guys coming around? Did they oh my God! They would come, and my mother was a great party thrower. Yeah. So all of these people who didn't come with their families would show up, and it would you know they always came to our house. Mm -hmm. But you'd see them pull my dad over to the side. One guy had a, an office in the Brinks, yeah. uh, which is uh, the BOQ. And he, uh, he pulled my dad aside and he said, listen, I need something. I'm going up country because I've got to make some trouble along the border. Mm -hmm. And I need something that I can carry and I can, like, dispose of. So my dad gave him bazookas. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> any cocaine, any heroin, or, or drugs, or any of that? You didn't see any of that stuff, right? Well, just actually, movies. no. My brother and I had a business. We, when I blackmailed him, yeah. it turned out he was selling things from the PX on the in the black market. Yeah. So he took me with him. He set me up with a mat and a coke stand, and we were we were selling baby powder and Hershey bars. Now, baby powder, a lot of my customers looked pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was going to be for something else. Oh, I see. You know? <laughs> that was your connection. Right that was there. it. And I would right. convince them that my blonde hair was the result of the baby powder. That's how I'd sell it. And, of course, <laughs> Cora Hershey bars sold no problem. I made right. a lot of money. Oh, right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Sandy Hanna, for joining us on Let Them Talk. And very interesting. Get the book. All right. I'm Paul Durienza.